<laughs> so, um, good afternoon. This, this whole day has been such a pleasure. Many thanks to my colleagues on this panel and um, uh, to the people who've spoken all day and been so illuminating. Um, uh, and to Benjamin and Ren, who have given us the occasion to look into these questions. Um, uh, one of the things I love about being a fellow at the New York Institute for the Humanities, uh, directed by Ren, has, is, that, is that this experience is, is, um, is a, a relatively, in, the, in this world, a common experience where you're suddenly presented with a wide variety of perspectives, um, um, extremely interesting and well-informed people telling you um, about things that you hadn't, hadn't thought about before. It's a, a real pleasure to be part of it. Um, I've just finished writing a biography of the um, art connoisseur Bernard Berenson um, and uh, thinking about his life in the picture trade. And so I've been immersed in questions of attribution for the last few years. Um, I guess my own, my own I, I, you know, there, there's been a question today about art and life, and I'm, I'm a biographer in some sense. So um, uh, my own thinking about biography is that um, Biography is not necessarily that illuminating of um, the art or literature made by an individual, but that art or literature is extremely illuminating of the life of the person. Um, I think that artworks and literary works are sometimes um, underused by biographers as evidence of the life, um, and maybe sometimes um, biography is overused um, in um, interpreting art and literature. Um, but that being said, I think it's very important to think about the life of the person um, and to try to think coherently about the life of the person and, uh, who made the work, and that is um, part of what's been very interesting to me in um, engaging with Benjamin Binstock's work. Um, I thought I would try to bring to today's conversation some thoughts about what you might call attributional styles, uh, ways of attributing paintings, because different people have very different styles of attribution. Um, and uh, in particular, these two um, BBs, Benjamin Binstock and Bernard Berenson, um, have in common a focus on what Berenson used to call artistic personality. Um, so I thought I would look into the emergence of that style a little bit, try to describe Berenson's way of attributing, um, see how it comes into play in the um, case of the Vermeer's Family Secrets, and spend a minute or two thinking about what kinds of resistance that attributional style encountered historically, um, which may suggest a few parallels with the resistance it discovers uh, today. Um, when Berenson began attributing the paintings of the Italian re Renaissance, uh, roughly in the mid to late 1880s and beginning of the 1890s, several of the styles of attribution that are now part of our regular understanding had relatively recently taken on their modern form. Um, until that point, attribution had been, as Berenson said, quote, more or less of a quack science practiced by people who were more or less quacks. Um, there were certainly expert connoisseurs and people with a delicate sense for who had painted what, but there weren't so many methods that could be discussed and followed by other connoisseurs. It's not an accident that these new methods of connoisseurship emerged um, in tandem with changes in scholarship more generally. Um, there was a, um, a general move toward uh, regularization and systematicity in the academy, um, but also art history itself wasn't even in the academy until right around this time. Um, at, until that point, art history was largely a matter of art um, technique taught by artists to other artists, and it didn't have a place in the academy. It's a, it's a real, relatively late arrived discipline. The first professors of art history in the United States are, are coming in in the um, 18, 1870s, essentially 1860s. Um, so um, so that, um, that is the context in which these new ideas about connoisseurship um, uh, were emerging, and uh, other important changes in the background were the advances in photography and in train travel, which made comparison of paintings much more possible. You really couldn't um, think about that kind of comparison uh, if, you, if a painting was uh, half a continent away and it was going to take you three weeks to get there. It was going to be a dim memory what the other Vermeer looked like by the time you got to seeing, um, well, in the case of Vermeer, they were close together, but um, <laughs> other paintings uh, were more widely separated. Um, so um, those are all changes which are occurring at the moment that connoisseurship um, begins to take on these different attributional styles. 
And um, uh, maybe the last really significant change following on what uh, Uli was saying is, um, is that this is a moment of uh, explosive changes in the art market when suddenly paintings are costing an enormous amount more than they used to cost. Um, it's a moment where suddenly capital becomes liquid, there are the railroads, there, are, there is kind of finance in a new way, and, um, and painting, the prices of paintings jump um, enormously. So. Um, People have varying degrees of um, a sense of causal relations among these things, but it's undeniable that the discipline of art history and the emergence of the modern art market come at the same time. Um, okay, so now these new styles of connoisseurship um, um, base themselves in different in different kind of fundamental. And now I suddenly have a very bright light on me. I can no longer see you, so if you can still hear me, that's excellent. Um, uh, uh, some of the styles of connoisseurship, they begin to base themselves in historical documentation, one group of people. Another group notices um, small details of paintings, earlobes, finger joints, drapery, and starts thinking, okay, painters have characteristic ways of making these small details, and that allows us to make comparisons among paintings. This is particularly Giovanni Morelli, who was somebody that um, Berenson followed very closely. Berenson's own contribution in this new world was to think about the artistic personality, which he felt was a way of seeing the body of work all together and thinking, who is a coherent person who could have developed in this way, who could have made first these works and then those works? And much as Benjamin has been interested in doing, he tried to order the works in a way that made sense in a life. And um, uh, so um, uh, one, one way of describing his sense of connoisseurship I'm quoting him from his three essays on method. He said, by, uh, by connoisseurship, I mean that sense of being in the presence of a given artistic personality, which comes from a long intimacy. Um, and I thought that for Berenson, his, when he looked at a painting and kind of felt this is painted by so-and-so or not painted by so-and-so, um, it was a sort of experience that we might have when somebody familiar comes into a room and we know from so many different ways that it is that person. We don't have to look up almost. We can tell from the way the door opens and the sound of the footsteps and the objects lingered over that it must be the person that we know. And I think for Berenson there was something similar in the sense that he knew these artistic personalities and this was part of how he made his judgments about attribution. Now this is a very difficult sort of way to make attributions because it's not very verifiable. Like other people can't necessarily experience it in the same way. And that's part of the difficulty of making judgments about artistic personality. People don't have necessarily corresponding ideas about uh, what that personality will be. And so you, um, uh, it, you can end up wanting to resort to historical documentation or technical evidence because it's easier to make agreement about those, those styles of attribution. Um, Berenson, uh, in, in working out these ideas, um, discovered a number of painters because he would say, these, this group of works must go together. And, um, and I don't yet know who the painter is, but there must be a single painter for these works. And uh, several of the people he discovered are still painters in existence today. There was then documentation would be discovered and the people would be verified. But in one famous case, he discovered somebody who didn't exist. He discovered a painter called, he called the Amico di Sandro. It was supposed to be a friend of Botticelli's. And, um, and he was quite wrong. All those paintings turned out to be by Filipino Lippi and other people. And um, so that's the danger of the artistic personality as a method of making attributional styles, um, as a method of making attributions. Um, so then I just thought I would say something about um, what I think is contributed by, by looking at things in that way, um, which is that, um, say, in, in the case of um, what uh, Benjamin Binstock has done by focusing on the careers of these artists, by trying to order all the paintings, it allows for considerations of interactions among the painters. And whether or not um, each of these interactions is accurately uh, documented in the case of what we've been hearing about today, it's a way of looking at the paintings, that they come out of the relations among painters and among painters and their families that seems to me very provocative and suggestive um, and true to the way that people actually work, that they are influenced by the other people around them. Um, and uh, you can see these influences because of, of the 
size of the Binstock enterprise and the conjunctions that he's put together um, in a way that is hard to see in the more isolating traditional monograph that doesn't include the careers of the people nearby. Um, and the separating out of Maria Vermeer, if she does indeed exist, is an example of what you can do if you're looking at the paintings in this way. Um, I think that part of the resistance that uh, Benjamin and another and Berenson ran into um, is is the resistance to that. In fact, it's it's not necessarily that people resist the genius, um, although that's a very complicated idea um, in in Benjamin Binstock's work and in, um, and in history in general. But uh, rather, I, I see in it a resistance to the small group and to the relationship um, that I, I think um, the, uh, a moving part of the story of Vermeer's family secrets is, is to see um, Vermeer as a person um, embedded in a world. And, um, and sometimes it can be that uh, people don't want to see an artist in, in that way. Um, they don't want to see the homely side of an artist, their daily work surrounded by family and children, um, the mutual dependencies of friendship and the long influence of teachers and students. Um, that's something that uh, Berenson's artistic personality style um, really drew attention to, and that I think is a, a strength of the current the work under discussion and, um, and something that um, is, is difficult to talk about in a verifiable way, but nonetheless important to consider in thinking about um, the way paintings affect us and the way painters think about what they do. Next. Okay. So I, I, it turns out I have a lot of echoes of what you just said, uh, so um, I'm sorry for the redundancies if they, if they occur. Um, we spent most of the day talking about Ben, but I want to um, discuss a dialogue involving an, another sort of investigator. I'll just read it very quickly to you. Inspector Gregory, Scotland Yard detective. Is there any other point to which you would wish to draw my attention? Sherlock Holmes, to the curious incident of the dog in the nighttime. Inspector Gregory. The dog did nothing in the nighttime. Holmes, that was the curious incident. OK, now I think, uh, well, at least I speculate. You know the story. It's that Holmes deduces from the fact that during the night when this horse was stolen and its trainer killed, the fact that the dog did not bark signifies that, in fact, um, the intruder uh, or the person doing the, 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 the damage um, was known to the dog, all right? So um, what I think. Um, Wren, in fact, um, is proposing is that the thunderous silence that greeted Ben's book says as much as a cacophony of, of call, so let's say barking critics would. Uh, no offense to critics, uh, I'm one of them. Um, and, and I don't know if that's true. Um, I don't even know how to answer the question of whether it's true. Is that a sociological question? Is that a philosophical question? Is it an economic question? Uh, it may be just a question about the ways in which um, the art bulletin decides which books of the so many books they get to send out to reviewers. I suspect Ben's publisher, Rillage, sent them the, the book, and whoever's the editor, maybe she or he's here today, um, tried to get uh, those uh, Vermeer scholars to review it, and each one, for one reason or another, said, I can't, or no, and then bit by bit, in some sense, there wasn't somebody to review the book. And aside from you know the disagreement uh, uh, scholars at the center of the field may have with Ben's thesis, thesis um, Ben's book is is kind of paratactic. It's 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 not syntactic. It doesn't he doesn't mount an argument from premises 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 to conclusion. It's sort of places like paratactic poetry, uh, lots of bits of of lots of fragments, lots of facts together, and allows us to in some sense intuit uh, what conclusion he's after, and that's a very difficult form of work to come to terms with. Uh, that doesn't mean that it's any uh, better or worse than the more plodding form of art history that, that we're all familiar with, unfortunately familiar with. Um, I think one thing is that, that's going on is that uh, um, Ben's book is in some sense a victim of its advanced press. Uh, 
And what I mean is that it was judged literally by its cover, all right? But those of you who read the book know that after the introduction, it's not till page 270 or so that he makes these explosive claims, or at least the most explosive one. Maria was not Vermeer's secret model, but his unknown apprentice, a member of the family whose activity was hidden from outsiders so well hidden that it has remained a family secret for over three centuries, all right? Now, it sounds conspiratorial, but that's not the whole of the book. In fact, uh, one of the things I admired about, about this text is the chronology, uh, uh, con contentious, but nonetheless factual, factually aiming chronology of Vermeer's works. And another thing I really liked about it was the, um, the account of uh, uh, Carl Fabricius uh, as a sort of missing link uh, between Rembrandt and Vermeer. Um, and I also appreciate um, the methodological uh, uh, arguments that, that Ben uh, develops against certain forms of traditional art history, um, beginning with the discussion of the, of the Heidegger, uh, um, Shapiro, and then Derrida, and then Ben uh, debate. Um, and so these are all virtues of the book, and they kind of get buried when we focus only on these explosive claims about Maria. All right. Um, that said, uh, uh, I think that there are uh, a, f a few <coughs> approaches to explaining what's going on. One of them has already been mentioned is money. And it doesn't, it's not sufficient to um, point to a certain kind of capital interest in the values of uh, these paintings being attributed to Vermeer as the explanation for the resistance to Ben's claims. But that doesn't mean that economic considerations don't play a role in a more indirect sense. Um, so I'm not going to name the institution, but some of you will recognize it from the terminology that I use. Um, a very, um, very powerful, um, very important uh, um, curator at a very important, very powerful um, New York institution, um, <laughs> whose name, in fact, was mentioned a few times today. Um, I know this um, is close to firsthand as you can get. Uh, was wandering through the galleries one day, noticed one of the Franz Halls, thought it looked kind of funny to him, and decided it was in fact a Judith Leister. So what did he do? do? He did what any curator does. He went to the administrative assistant and said, could you type something up for me? And he dictated what he wanted on this wall label, and then had her go and replace what was there, the Franz Halls, with the new attribution, Judith Leister. So it was a slow month at this institution <laughs> up on Fifth Avenue. And, uh, uh, and, uh, and it was only until about two and a half, three weeks later that this curator received a call. The call came at 6 in the morning saying, you have to be on the mezzanine by 7.30. And he showed up at the mezzanine. And there were the director of the museum and the lawyer and someone else who's an expert in this area and said, all attributions go through the mezzanine. And that was it. And from that moment onward, no curator at this museum was allowed to change the attributions of anything that happened to be hanging on the walls. Why is that so? Well, you know, it's not as if this institution was going to sell that painting anytime soon and probably never would. Um, it probably would have to pay less insurance on, on the painting after that. Um, but it did change, in some sense, a whole other uh, um, set of, of, of uses for that, for that painting. It can no longer be lent out in exchange for similarly illustrious works if the Leicester attribution held. Um, it couldn't be presented to visiting dignitaries and so on, right, as our Franz Halls, and so on and so on. And so in some sense, these are kind of indirect influences of, of economic considerations um, on attribution, but they're there nonetheless. All right. Um, and as you know, those of you who've tried to do this or who, who study art, who are uh, trained as art historians yourselves, um, you, you can't any longer um, call up, uh, you know, uh, Tim Clark at the art history department and say, look, I have this thing, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm not sure, I think it's a Syrah. Could you come and look at it or can I send you a picture? Um, if you look on the web pages for lots of art history departments now, you will find some sort of notice saying, we will not do attributions, all right? And the same thing goes for uh, curators at the Met and other institutions, wonder why that's in my head. Uh, um, and, and the reason is uh, um, uh, that, 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 that now experts in art history are being sued left and right 
for um, de-attributions, of course, usually not for attributions. Uh, and so um, they're in a lot of danger. And, and it's not that this is a theoretical uh, possibility. It's, it's happening again and again. You could read the art newspaper. All right. So let's talk, we talked about money. Let's talk about the other thing we care about, gender, all right? Uh, it's odd that uh, feminist art history, as it's practiced today, hasn't embraced um, this thesis, at least to run with it a little, a, a, you know, a little distance. Um, it was easier, I think, with Ar Artemisia Gentileschi because in some sense, well, at least in my view, she was a better painter than her father. And so when a lot of paintings uh, um, by this Car Caravaggio type uh, um, artist were, were um, deattributed uh, uh, from her father and then attributed to uh, Artemisia, um, in some sense, uh, th that made sense uh, because the other work she had done was of similar quality. Um, and I think one of the difficulties here is that is that there isn't really a feminist art history any longer that searches out great women artists. And I wish Linda Nochlin were here today. That's not the way feminist art history is done any longer. Uh, but there is a version of feminist art history that's done today that actually holds a certain kind of uh, methodological principle that runs against uh, a lot of what has been said. And this form of art history is one that sees um, aspects of the life as utterly fair game sensitively handled in interpreting the work. We no longer are these aesthetes who think that we approach works of art with you know, Ruskin's innocent eye. Not only is there no innocent eye, but I don't know any art historian, well, let's say under 95, who's committed to that. You know, there was a moment when um, Thomas Hoving did this and Clement Greenberg did this, right? They thought they could judge a masterpiece by covering their eyes. And Greenberg, you know, there are all these anecdotes, probably apocryphal, about him visiting studios, sitting on one of those swiveling stools, right? And then having the painting being brought before, behind his back, and then swinging around and looking at it, right? And deciding right then and there, was it a masterpiece? Was it any good or not, all right? That's, utterly implausible as a method for understanding the value or for appreciating the value of, of works of art. Uh, and we all know that because uh, in some sense, um, uh, a work of art that we can appreciate and understand in an instant is probably one we're not gonna be appreciating an instant later, right? Um, there's a reason why the Vermeers have been there, all right. So there is no innocent eye. So what is the, what's, the, what's, what's uh, the contrary to that? Well, it's that we're interested in works of art in some ways, in light of what we know about them, their history, their origin, the, the, the social context in which they were created, and sometimes in terms of who created them, and what was the family structure of that person, and was this person, as, as Ben suggests, I, th I think quite persuasively, uh, I'm not saying I agree with the, the claims themselves, uh, I, I, I'm not equipped to judge, but uh, as Ben suggests, you know, that in some sense the family dynamic helps explain some of what is being done in these paintings. For example, how you might have, hypothetically, a child trying to emulate her father, right? And that would explain certain kinds of um, artificial elements in the work that might, in fact, conflict with the more sort of youthful, uh, um, uh, self-dramatizing, uh, focus on you know, the expression, the eyes, the here I am. And we, you know, those of us who have teenagers as children know that drama, right, that for self-expression right, that they have. Um, and that may be something that's going on in these paintings that's conflicting with the sort of more sober, uh, um, conventional ways of, of presenting their content. Okay. Uh, one last thing, and I'm, I told Rachel I'd quote Bar uh, Bernard Berenson. Um, there are certain painters that uh, are very hard to even think about today without knowing certain things about them, or at least believing th certain things about them. So in 1951, the book was published in 1953, Berenson uttered three words, this is a book on Caravaggio, uttered three words that changed Caravaggio's scholarship. And those three words were possibly a homosexual, all right? Now, whether Caravaggio was gay or not, okay, in Seicento terms, I don't even know how to translate that, 
um, I mean, what it would mean to, to, to adopt that ide identity, um, is not really the question. Uh, the, the, the point is rather that, um, that when Berenson said this, now people have been talking about Caravaggio and, and the Oedipus complex and sexuality and so on and so on for so long, but nobody was, 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 was coming out, literally, and saying uh, and identifying uh, his orientation as in some way relevant to understanding his work. Now today, that's a kind of growth industry in Caravaggio studies, all right? <laughs> um, and, uh, and, you know, and Robert Longhi, another great, Roberto Longhi, another great art historian at the time, um, uh, rejected Berenstein's, Berenstein's claim um, by saying that, well, that can't be true because we know Caravaggio had a girlfriend, all right? Uh, now, I point that out as just an example, a kind of ridiculous debate, right, within art history uh, that at the time people thought, oh, yeah, Roberto Longhi, obviously he's right, okay? Um, and, and let me then, then expand from that uh, uh, to, the, to a, a general claim about sort of art historical methodology. Uh, we all have our sort of um, principles that guide our, our research and scholarship. I'm a philosopher and I have certain kinds of principles. I think that if it doesn't conform to this principle, it can't be any good. I don't know why it's not good, it just doesn't conform. But if you start to look at the, the principles that have been uttered today uh, to either justify uh, Ben's approach or to condemn it, you know, they're pretty vacuous. Um, so what, what have I heard today? I've heard, uh, uh, okay, um, I've heard um, principles of economy, all right? Okay, I've heard Occam's razor, all right? I've heard the, um, I like this one, uh, it's Liebke's, it's, it's the highest quality element that you should attribute, a, you know, do your attribution of a painting based on sort of what's best in the painting. And I think the, 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 the intuition here is that um, you set up kind of a high jump bar, right? And you know, if the person can get over that bar, right, that says they're a certain kind of athlete, and, um, and then there are lots of people who can get over lower level bars, right? But that's the, if you can reach that level, there's no faking it, as it were, all right? Well, I think these principles are, you know, they're good heuristics, right? And scientists obviously use them as well, but they're just that, they're heuristics. And if you know, which means that they're good rules of thumb for proceeding, but they're not, they're not dogma. They're not something that will constrain the truth of a claim. They just kind of suggest how to go about assessing the truth of various claims. And as you noticed, and you, you, know, you read any art history text today, uh, um, everybody uses a given heuristic if it proves their point, and then they reject the heuristic. They go against conventional opinion, right, if the heuristic conflicts with what they want to say, all right? So I think they're pretty much useless in terms of arguments, as premises and arguments, but they are useful in terms of just guiding your research, and of course you want to tell your graduate students, you know, go about it this way, don't go about it that way, all right. Uh, and one of the last things I want to say is this. Um, the, the art is life, life is art, I've already touched on that. I, that's a false dichotomy, all right? There used to be a, a pretty crude kind of psychoanalytic interpretation of art, right? Ernest Jones is, you know, Hamlet is really just Shakespeare, you know, dealing with his Oedipal complex and so on, right? Um, no one does that today, right? Um, but that doesn't, doesn't mean you have to essentially reject all you know of the life in interpreting the art. What you have to do is you have to at least be open to the possibility, okay? not the certainty, that the life might be reflected in the art indirectly, okay? In terms of what the artist uses or how the artist approaches his or her given materials, that can be shaped by the life, all right? And the last thing is about authority, okay? We have three kinds, we have authority over three kinds of things, at least so far I've, I've heard today. Over facts, you know, the empirical facts, right? And those are kinds of things that we don't need a methodology so much to establish. Uh, uh, um, sometimes, you know, a chemist will, will say this procedure won't give you good data, okay. Um, but it, that's one, facts, value judgments, is it any good, right? And then there's a certain kind of recognitional capacity. Does it look, we've heard this a lot today, does it look like a Vermeer? Does it look like those other paintings that we know to be uh, autographic? Um, and the thing about this, uh, these, these forms of authority is that um, I recognize them in um, almost every field that I recognize as a genuine field. I don't think there's such a thing as an authority in astrology. I don't think astrologers, when they argue with each other, are arguing about anything, all right? But I do recognize it among medical researchers and among, you know, my, my car mechanic and so on. And so when it comes to art history, sure, uh, 
a lot less turns probably on what happens, what we determine in the end uh, to be true about a particular painting um, than, than turns on a medical researcher's authority. But nonetheless, I recognize the authority. And, um, and I think that's, the, that's difficult sometimes for some people, but, but think about it this way. Uh, when I look at, the, at, the, at, the, at a clear sky in the evening, I see little twinkling lights. If I'm standing next to an astronomer, not an astrologer, and we're looking at the same thing, by, by stipulation we are looking at the same thing, I know that she sees things I don't. Is that because she has better eyes than I do? Well, yes and no in some sense, but not really, right? It's that she has a certain kind of judgment that allows her to understand what she's seeing, to understand the configurations that are there, okay? To see the constellations. I don't see any of that. I see twinkling lights, all right? Now, our recognitional capacity to be able to see that this is like that other painting or unlike it, sufficiently so to say they're not by the same painter, that recognitional capacity, as it is in any other field, far outruns our verbal ability to articulate it, okay? That's what being an expert or a connoisseur is. And the fact that it outruns our ability to articulate what we know, and that's the same thing is true as athletes as well, right? Doesn't mean that we don't know something when we make those distinctions. The difficulty, and the difficulty I think we see with Ben's book, is just that you don't get to just claim authority. You have to argue for your conclusions. And arguing for these conclusions means putting your insight, your recognition, in some verbal form that people can detach from your own expression of it, your own uh, strong intuition. And um, that's something that may or may not happen with these claims. But I, I thank Ren for bringing them to the public awareness, um, because that may begin now. OK, thank you. First of all, um, thank you, Ren, and uh, for inviting me up here. So I'm supposed to be a generalist, which of course nobody is. Um, I have a lot to say, but I won't say it. Um, I'll be very brief because David also wants a little bit of time, so I'll be very, very brief. If you could put up the two Frick um, uh, paintings up there, the soldier and laughing girl, and then the girl interrupted, that'd be great. So a few things I just wanted to note. The category of genius, I think Ben needs to be interrogated a bit more. Um, it's a romantic idea that kind of the British romantics took up Shelley Keats. That's how we receive it largely, then through a filter through Emerson. And um, it can be constructed in the 20th century. Brecht very famously once said, genius is a bourgeois idea that allows people to attach value to things that they don't understand. I don't believe in it, with the great exception of Rilke, who he said <laughs> that was a genius. Um, and I'm actually, a part of my work, I spend editing and translating Rilke's works. And uh, why I brought up value earlier today, monetary value, because if I reattribute a poem by Rilke and say it's actually not by Rilke, but it's maybe by Karl Kraus written in a deep, ironic, resentful, angry <laughs> rebuke to Rilke, who was flirting with his girlfriend, then it doesn't really matter to anybody because that poem wasn't worth any money. It does matter to people because it will change the path of their career, potentially, if they spend a lot of time talking about this Rilke poem, which really turns out not to be a Rilke poem, but one by Karl Kraus. <laughs> uh, so the, the kind of secondary effects that you just named are, of course, very real in the world. And I'm surprised at the mezzanine of that august institution. The other person I thought I'm imagining in my novelistic imagination is a trustee of that institution standing next to that and saying, and I actually am very committed to the fact that that painting is attributed to a certain kind of Franz Hals because it's a certain value that has something to do with who I am on this board and in relation to this institution. Um, the reason why I brought that up is because it changes the conversation in art history from that of other disciplines. So if we had a, a discussion here about literary um, disciplines, uh, Shakespeare, you know, to assign the, you know, the place to the bard is a kind of game. Um, that used to be a game among men and who is the right bard. And then Virginia Woolf made that a political game, actually, to say maybe there was a sister, so people have to at least take that into consideration. But there's no financial stake as explicitly. There is one, of course, obviously, when they're putting on, uh, you, you pointed out, which was really important. It's not just a financial number, but other things. These two paintings right here. So I actually thought this afternoon when someone was talking about history and these sort of locations in history, I thought what Vermeer does actually is he allows us to 
understand something which is quite fundamental at this moment, and one of the reasons why I'm thinking about this is because Walter Benjamin, who came out writing books that were extremely stated, that have a huge impact, he didn't get tenure, he was one of those people, and I even named them earlier, uh, no, someone named them earlier, I'm, saying, I'm sorry, someone said, um, the meek shall actually succeed, in academia they do, but Nietzsche is somebody, Foucault is somebody, Walter Benjamin is somebody, they came out with things that were so overstated that we tend to read today. But they also didn't have, I mean, Nietzsche had a career, but that isn't what we would want to have as a career. Benjamin had none. What I'm interested in is here the difference between our experience of time and our knowledge of time. And we're in a casino-like atmosphere with no natural daylight in this room, so we could go on for days. We wouldn't know it's day or night. <laughs> what Vermeer is doing, he's actually, you, and what I think we do in front of art, and you know, I was sort of trained as an art historian at some moment in my life in some way, but you know, unsuccessfully maybe. I think we see ourselves largely, and we see the way we see in front of art. I do not believe actually we see Delft and we see Vermeer and we see that. I do not think we even care really, but we actually care of how we are in relation to that, which is a kind of Kerner experience you know, in front of the painting. What we see is maybe there's a difference between what we know about time and how we experience it. And what I think you know in the left painting is you would probably in this room be able to figure out roughly what time of day it is. That is a really fundamental thing for us as humans to know when this takes place. And there are ways to decode this, you know, obviously how they're dressed, what's happening, you know, what's on the table. But the light is really critical, and our experience of light is one of the fundamental experiences of time. So when someone talked about history early on in relation to this, I don't think this is really about history so much. Because history is our knowledge of time, but not our experience of time um, in a kind of rough way. And so these paintings are concerned with something else, and what you call the everyday and then the family secrets, I think the everyday is not necessarily kind of the mundane, the way we live and conduct our life, but actually the everyday is the experience of, uh, the, of the momentariness of time. And that, I think, was what Vermeer is in. Then the second question I have, and I'll end right there. So then you attribute this to Maria. And I don't think you quite do enough work to actually give us the context. And I'm sorry, I forgot your name because you had to do the panel. Um, Martha, thank you. So Martha gave us more context of trying to understand what it would mean for a woman to have painted this painting. And I think you need to do more work on the question of gender to actually deepen this for us, because what we end up getting from you is an argument saying, this is a Vermeer on the left, and this is another Vermeer, but ultimately every time it's lesser. For the financial reasons I mentioned, the monetary value and all these careers staked on that. But the lesser is not necessarily how I would look at it. It's different. And I think once you get to that place, and you can't get there, but other people may get there, to say, how do we look at the six or seven misfit paintings on their own terms, and maybe they create something else? Which is exactly what has happened with Vermeer, because he was discovered, I don't know, how many years after he painted? 100 and over 150 years. Shakespeare was discovered and invented for us. Hölderlin was discovered in 1910. He did not write in 1910. He stopped writing in 1804, roughly. These people did not, we were not ready. So in some ways, if we are not ready for Vermeer, Vermeer, I think it's a shortcoming to say, oh, it's lesser, which I understand, and I can t I'm sure why these institutions, you know, on the Upper East Side don't want to reattribute things for the reasons we've all named. But if we understand them not as a differential, there's one is lesser than the other, but they're just different. And to mark that difference in way Martha was sort of trying to start to understand, the categories we use are not even applicable. You said, essentially, there was no adolescence. I mean, there wasn't even childhood, according to Philippe Arias. You know, and adolescence is invented not even by Freud, but by Erickson much later. This doesn't exist as categories. So how do we look at the right painting in the right way and what your book is trying to do is this, you said, you want to teach us how to love Maria Vermeer. That's the idea. Which is one way of saying, we have to learn how to see things. And that's what, so I think the next project would be to just talk about the six or seven misfit paintings and say, what do you do, what do these pictures teach us besides they are not Vermeers? That's where gender, I think, could become a productive category. So I'll stop right here because David really should go on now. There's no more microphone, but I may not need one. Uh, yeah. Do I need one? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you can do Thank you very much, Ren and Ben, for inviting me, allowing me to participate. It's been a um, 
fascinating and fabulous presentations and discussions. Um, and I have to admit uh, that my brain is full. <laughs> and I know wherever I speak because I'm a neuroscientist. <laughs> and, uh, so why am I here? I, I ask myself that, and you should certainly ask yourself that. And um, I'll only go on for about 30 or 45 minutes. So <laughs> if, yeah, okay. Um, I'm here uh, purely by biographical accident. I met Ben about 10 years ago or so at the American Academy in Berlin. We were both fellows. And in fact, Chuck Close, who's regrettably not here anymore, was a uh, was a visitor during our time there as well. And we were sitting around, uh, we met each other, and it was the first time I was exposed to some of Ben's ideas and arguments. And my first reaction was, geez, you know, what a nut job. <laughs> um, but then the semester <laughs> developed, and we hung out a lot. We had fabulous food, we drank too much. And um, after a while, I came to think, geez, um, he actually has a theory. So I'm a neuroscientist, I work on the human brain, and I've been in plenty of controversies, and I like to get into brawls. And I thought, wow, well, he has a theory, and he's actually trying to accumulate evidence to test that theory, very much the same way I try to do that in my own field. And I thought that was pretty interesting, and after the semester I thought, you know what, uh, I actually appreciate the merits of his case. Um, I found it kind of interesting today that the merits of the specific case haven't really been addressed. Uh, and I wonder why that is. So we've heard arguments. This has just been uh, uh, raised again. So there's the argument from authority. Uh, you, are, you were a bully, you're outrageous, and your writing style doesn't conform to the normative criteria of the academy. Uh, I'm not interested in that argument. In, my, in the natural sciences, you just can't make that argument. There's a fact of the matter and you have to figure, you have to make a case for or against that fact. Uh, we have the, um, Chuck Close made the argument from incredulity. How could that possibly be true? It doesn't make any sense. That's a non-argument. Right? So that's, uh, I mean, I, it's an interesting thing to say, but it's not an argument about the, the merits of the case. So um, I, I've been, it's as an observer, as a, you know, fascinating that he has a methodology. We see it here, it's just this, this magnificent display of to scale images uh, and a developed chronology and a hypothesis about the origin of these things. And where is actually the person who's going to say, I disagree with this argument? That's why I guess I'm missing here. So who's walking up to say and saying, actually, you're wrong about this, and you're wrong in your argument about the following four Maria Vermeers? That is what I don't quite understand. That's, I guess, where our fields differ, and where I'd love to see more interaction. Maybe somebody from the audience will walk up and, and change the chronology. So that's, that's sort of where, uh, what my expectations were, and I learned some valuable lessons. So I do have a point about the, a, a methodological point I want to make, and that is about how we deal with pictures, whether it's a single picture or some paint chip off of a picture that we run through a gas chromatograph or something like that. Um, so in my own work, I take pictures, I do brain imaging like, like that. <laughs> and the, um, so let me give you, I give, I'll give you a one slide summary of some of the work in my own laboratory, just to give you, and there, I promise there will be a point and it will be brief. Um, so I work on, and part of my research on the nature of, how, of the temporal structure of perceptual experience. So what, what is time? So here's, we, when we talk about time, you have to talk about Newton. And Newton said, absolute, true mathematical time of itself and by its own nature flows equably without relation to anything external. Uh, that will not be on the test. That's very, uh, that means this, time flies like an arrow. Okay? It's a continuous variable. And in fact, that conforms with our intuition. We think that time sort of flows in like that. So the work I do about the perceptual experience, particularly about language processing, suggests that from a brain's eye view, it's really a series of little temporal islands like that. So it's a much more discretized computational system. In my actual work, the argument I make, and this is uh, what we're getting somewhere, is something like this. What's going on in your head is a series of little temporal windows that are of multiple sizes. So the world that you're sitting here and experiencing is a continuous flow of information coming into you is actually little movies chopped up 
where the granularity of the time is of a different size. Okay, so that's a hypothesis. Now, how do we deal with? It? So how can I explain? So uh, of course, like everyone else, I have to put in the you know the picture that belongs here. How do I explain this intuition to people when I give a technical talk about it? I show them this. <coughs> so look at this interesting picture. It's made up out of little squares, beautifully colored. Uh, you can't really see what's going on from a configural point of view, but when I show you the whole thing, it becomes something you know quite obvious. Why is this relevant? Because the information that's carried at the local scale and the configural global scale, we talk about in terms of spatial frequency, is completely different. Right? So this is, this is the kind of intuition we try to convey. Now, how do we test these ideas? We stick people in brain scanners. Uh, now, what should disturb you is that this old picture that somebody sent me from Berlin looks a lot like my lab. <laughs> this is, uh, and uh, so now, now we get to, to the, the point I, you know, you might contemplate. So what comes out of these machines? So we have all kinds of fancy machines. We spend too much money on it. And let me tell you what I'm not going to do, neurohumanities. I'm not going to put you in and say, here's a blob, because why not? Well, this, this is the heart of the matter. So there's a long tradition of trying to figure out where things are in the head. A very beautiful, you know, the original brain scanning can be attributed to Franz Josef Gall using the hand scanner. <laughs> so you put, you try to feel someone's bumps, you deduce from that. So there was a, a he had a not very good idea called phrenology. But if you read the book to the end, he had a very interesting, important idea called organology, what we now call faculty psychology, that there's a parts list of the mind. Uh, that was a good idea. So what he came up with was a theory that there are localized functions. Okay, that's some, something like that is actually still true. And why do you care about that? Well, why, why do you have to worry about that? Because that's, in fact, the intuition that drives most of modern neuroscience. So when you look at, say, some publication on brain activity, it looks like that. Right? So the metaphor is the brain is on fire. So you might say, oh, well, that's some art department for a magazine. How is that relevant? Well, the fact of the matter is that's precisely the kind of visualization we give in the sciences to activity of the mind. So here's a real, from a very fancy journal, a journal of neuroscience, a brain on fire kind of image of this is during some aspect of language processing. So there are actually localized things in the head. I mean, certainly true in the case of, you know, that's, that's actually the picture in the brain of a monkey looking at this kind of weird annual. Isn't that amazing? So the question, by the way, of, is, are there pictures in the head? We can answer with yes. This is a picture on the outside. We stain the monkey's brain. This is the monkey's visual cortex. This is the picture of, that was on the outside. There's no question, right? There's a direct picture. Uh, here's more compellingly, like, what is your mind's view of your body? It looks something like that. Okay, so that's regrettable, but true. <laughs> so, what's the, so that's all very fine and good. That's what we've arrived at in the last you know, 20 to 30 years. Why am I telling you this? Well, in the sciences, too, we're making the same kind of mistake that apparently happens here. There's, we follow some kind of map dogma, or the, what I call the cartographic imperative. You try to have a picture, and you try to put things in a picture, and then you think you suddenly have an explanation. And that is the thing I object to. So you take a single picture, or you take a single paint chip, and you believe you suddenly have an account of something. This is in the neuroscience, it's particularly egregious in things that you, know, you go through the press, like there's the free will spot, or my personal favorite, the God spot, <laughs> or you know, the morality lobe, that sort of thing. So you know, believe me that serious neuroscientists certainly don't take this seriously. Right? This is, you know, it's not even wrong. <laughs> the, <laughs> the physicist Wolfgang Pauli, I think, says that. So why, okay, why raise this? It's because, um, because I think Ben has a case. Right? So his case is, is, this is now I'm a little sort of pedantic, school marmish and annoying. Uh, we take single pictures or localizations, we make a map, but let me tell you, we know that it's not an explanation. It's just a piece of data, right? So some picture by itself, one of these pictures, is some datum, uh, but it's not yet a piece of evidence. What Ben has, and what I haven't heard talked about here, is a, an opposing theory. He has a theory 
I mean, so I disagree a little bit about the nature of the argument. I think he does have a hypothesis that he tries to marshal evidence for. So I think you, you started out by saying he doesn't really have that. So, but I'm not an expert in, you know, in reading this. But I think he has, he has a particular position on what the chronology is, on who the family members are, and that Maria exists. And uh, so that's a theory. You know, that's a hypothesis to test. So I think we want to be careful in talking about this. So one distinction we make is the difference between just a datum some you know, sort of uh, a little point of fact of the matter, and evidence. So evidence is something that we view in the context of a theory that allows us to make this distinction, and that's relational, right? That's, that's you know, we form relations between things. And so that allows us the difference between just a description of the things and an explanation. And what we ultimately want, at least in my field, is an explanation, not just a description of the things. So. What, I, what I, le I learned a lot, uh, I appreciate it, and it was wonderful. And what, one of the things I learned is that when I read and talk to Ben, he th seems to think of this technical stuff, like uh, let's take some paint chip and scan it, as that's sort of data accumulation that might be completely irrelevant. Uh, and what he, I guess, wants is a kind of informed, theory-driven connoisseurship, which would be evidence accumulation in light of a theory. And so, um, I think that's the way to go. I mean, you should, and so you should not be dissuaded. So my recommendation for you is from a, a line that I believe comes from Marion Gräfin Dönhoff, the former editor of Die Zeit. Man muss sich frei machen vom Lob der anderen. You have to uh, free yourself from the praise of others. Just plug away, accumulate evidence in light of the theory, and remain unshackled from the praise of others. So that's all I have to say. Thanks very much. <laughs>
engaging with Benjamin Binstock's work. Um, I thought I would try to bring to today's conversation some thoughts about what you might call attributional styles, uh, ways of attributing paintings, because different people have very different styles of attribution. Um, and uh, in particular, these two um, BBs, Benjamin Binstock and Bernard Berenson, um, have in common a focus on what Berenson used to call artistic personality. Um, so I thought I would look into the emergence of that style a little bit, try to describe Berenson's way of attributing, um, see how it comes into play in the um, case of the Vermeer's Family Secrets, and spend a minute or two thinking about what kinds of resistance that attributional style encountered historically, um, which may suggest a few parallels with the resistance it discovers uh, today. Um, when Berenson began attributing the paintings of the Italian re Renaissance, uh, roughly in the mid to late 1880s and beginning of the 1890s, several of the styles of attribution that are now part of our regular understanding had relatively recently taken on their modern form. Um, until that point, attribution had been, as Berenson said, quote, more or less of a quack science practiced by people who were more or less quacks. Um, there were certainly expert connoisseurs and people with a delicate sense for who had painted what, but there weren't so many methods that could be discussed and followed by other connoisseurs. It's not an accident that these new methods of connoisseurship emerged um, in tandem with changes in scholarship more generally. Um, there was a, um, a general move toward uh, regularization and systematicity in the academy, um, but also art history itself wasn't even in the academy until right around this time. Um, at, until that point, art history was largely a matter of art um, technique taught by artists to other artists, and it didn't have a place in the academy. It's a, it's a real, relatively late arrived discipline. The first professors of art history in the United States are, are coming in in the um, 18, 1870s, essentially 1860s. Um, so um, so that, um, that is the context in which these new ideas about connoisseurship um, uh, were, 